between my finger and my thumb the squat pen rests snug as a gun under my window a clean rasping sound when the spade sinks into gravelly ground my father digging i look down till his straining rump among the flower beds bends low comes up twenty years away stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging the coarse boot nestled on the lug the shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly he rooted out tall tops buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked loving their cool hardness in our hands by god the old man could handle a spade just like his old man my grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's bog. Once I carried him milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sods over his shoulder, going down and down for the good turf. Digging. The cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head. But I have no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. The poem you just heard is the opening poem of a 1966 poetry collection published by Faber and Faber. The poetry collection is called Death of a Naturalist, and that first poem is called Digging. These were by a new voice in British poetry, Seamus Haney. Now, when I say British poetry, I have to be careful, because Seamus Haney was the most popular and probably the most beloved poet in Britain in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. But Seamus Haney wasn't British. Seamus Haney was born in 1939 in Northern Ireland. And he grew up in Northern Ireland around Belfast, went to university in Belfast, and became a school teacher in the Belfast area. But by the time his career really started kicking into gear in the 70s, he moved down to Dublin in the southern part of Ireland and lived the rest of his life with Dublin as his home base. Now, if you don't know a lot about Irish history, that Belfast to Dublin move might not mean much to you. But over the last century, Belfast and Northern Ireland have been under the control of the British government. The United Kingdom includes Northern Ireland as part of it. Southern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, we now know it as, was free and is free. Ireland has a very checkered history, much more detailed than I even could give an overview of. So it's telling, I think, that the most popular and beloved poet in the British Isles in the late 20th and early 20th century, 21st century, was in fact an Irishman. And Seamus Haney, by the 1970s until his death, always identified as Irish, not British. And in fact, his poetry was included in an anthology of British poetry, and he asked that it be removed because he didn't consider himself a British poet. He was an Irish poet. Let's talk a little bit more about this poem, Digging. Digging describes both... Seamus Haney's father, but also kind of the generational heritage of potato farming. And it gives, I think in a, in a very apt to the 1960s style of detailed description of a man digging, you can feel the dirt uh, under the fingernails and uh, under the shovel. But also it shows a young writer Haney was not even 30 when he wrote this poem. It shows a young writer realizing he's not going to have the same life, the same life calling as the generations of men who came before him. He has a pen in his hand, not a shovel. And he says, I'll dig with that. And with this, I'll dig with that. 
Haney kind of announces to the world, announces to the reading public especially, that he's going to continue the traditions of his Irish ancestors, digging potatoes. You know, when we think about the history of Ireland, we think about potatoes as the sustaining substance through famine and oppression. He's going to do that act of Irish digging, but he's going to do it with a pen. And throughout Haney's career from the 60s all the way up until his death in 2013, Haney was doing the digging, was representing Irish work in a way that was literary and literate and created, I think, especially in the British Isles and in the Republic of Ireland and in Europe, maybe more than in America, created the conception of what poetry, poetry in English in that part of the world, was going to be. We looked at Larkin in our last video, and I think it's telling that the Larkin of the 50s and the Haney of the 60s are working in a similar register. This is very colloquial English. The lines are largely iambic pentameter, and there's a loose rhyme, and yet there's not a strong desire, I think, on the poet's part to really call attention to the meter and rhyme. It's there, and it's creating a understructure for the words, but the images and the statements are what matter most. Haney would continue this throughout his career. Haney became not a university professor first after he went to university. He became a school teacher. And in fact, he never really sought the graduate school track. He got many honorary doctorates. He earned a doctor of letters at some point later in his career. But Haney was primarily interested in being a poet and a teacher of whoever wanted to be taught. He eventually was hired by Harvard University and then finally Oxford University um, as a university professor. And kind of the peak of his career as a teacher was as Oxford's professor of poetry in the late 80s and early 90s. And we've talked about the Oxford professor of poetry in previous videos, and it's worth looking up his tenure as Oxford professor of poetry because for people who maybe were on the more academic literary side, he showed that he had those chops. He couldn't just write good poetry. His poetic theory and his theory of language and its place in culture was very robust as well. Perhaps the most indelible mark that Haney has made, though, on the English-speaking world and on our conception of English literature is his 1999 translation, The Beowulf. Now, you've probably seen this. If Beowulf was assigned to you as a high schooler or as an undergraduate, you probably read Haney's Beowulf if you went to school sometime in the last 25 years. Haney's Beowulf was, in one sense, radical. Here's an instance. The opening line in Anglo-Saxon starts with the Anglo-Saxon word hoit, which means something like hear or listen. And most translators before Haney translated that word as low or hark. But Haney, in his more democratic, straightforward, engaging way, translated it in a really interesting way. Let, let me read you the opening lines of Haney's Beowulf. So, the spear Danes in days gone by, and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. There was shield chiefson, scourge of many tribes, a wrecker of mead benches, rampaging among foes. This terror of the hall troops had come far, a foundling to start with. He would flourish later on as his powers waxed and his worth was proved. In the end, each clan on the outlying coasts beyond the whale road had to yield to him and begin to pay tribute. That was one good king. Haney is following the basic structure, even metrically, of the Anglo-Saxon. And yet his language is accessible in a way that Babel translators before him hadn't have been. And that's so 
that starts it. So, the Spear Danes in days gone by. It's so late 20th, early 20th, 21st century. It almost feels like you're watching an, a vlog or a, I don't know, you're, you're, in a, you're in a chatty American or British sitcom. Someone sitting down and saying, so... That's the beginning of an interesting story, probably about social interactions, maybe a funny story, maybe a drama story. It's almost a reality TV word. But Haney uses it to get our attention to then tell us about the S.H.I.E.L.D. Danes and Days Gone By, of S.H.I.E.L.D. Chiefson, and eventually of the great Beowulf, who will come and be the savior of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s people. This was radical, and mostly it was embraced. The most read translation, the most assigned translation in the English-speaking world for a long time has been Haney's Beowulf. And if you get nothing else from this video other than you should read Seamus Haney's Beowulf, then that's fine. Haney also translated ancient Greek poetry and ancient Latin poetry. After he translated Beowulf, he published translations of Greek tragedies, uh, one of the most interesting is his translation called Burial at Thebes, which is a translation of Sophocles' Antigone. But he also kept writing his own poetry throughout his career. And I want to look in the last part of this video at a couple late poems that I think are picking up on some of the same subtle metrical techniques and rhyming techniques that he started with back in 66 in Death of a Naturalist and showed that he was still really capable of up until till his death in 2013. These are two poems from Haney's final collection, Human Chain. As we read them to close out the video, listen for the subtle pentameter as well as wordplay that I would argue is a little more complex than in his early poems. And also pay attention to how he ends each poem with a final turn of thought that I think is both fitting for a final collection and kind of acts as a goodbye to readers who have followed him throughout his life. Human chain for Terence Brown, seeing the bags of meal passed hand to hand in close up by the aid workers and soldiers firing over the mob, I was braced again with a grip on two sack corners, two packed wads of grain I had worked to lugs to give me purchase, ready for the heave, the eye to eye, one two, one two, upswing onto the trailer. Then the stoop and drag and drain of the next lift. Nothing surpassed that quick unburdening. Back breaks truest payback. A letting go which will not come again. Or it will once and for all. Had I not been awake. Had I not been awake, I would have missed it. A wind that rose and whirled until the roof pattered with quick leaves off the sycamore and got me up, a whole, the whole of me a patter, alive and ticking like an electric fence. Had I not been awake, I would have missed it. It came and went so unexpectedly, and almost it seemed dangerously, returning like an animal to the house, a courier blast that there and then lapsed ordinary but not ever after, and not now.